On December the 22nd, 1960, in Brooklyn, New York, Jean-Michel Basquet was born as the second of four children to Mathilde Andrades and Gerard Basquet. He had two younger sisters, Lisanne and Jeannie, and an older brother, Max, who died shortly before his birth. His mother, Mathilde, was also born in Brooklyn to Puerto Rican parents, while his father, Gerard, was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And so Jean grew up in a multilingual household where he fluently spoke Spanish, English, and French. A major source of inspiration for him would be his diverse cultural heritage. Basquet began drawing incessantly at an early age on sheets of paper his father, an accountant, brought home from the office. The subjects of his drawings were mostly of his favorite cartoons or films, particularly by Alfred Hitchcock. He was always so bright, absolutely an unbelievable mind. He drew and painted all of his life from the time he was three or four years old, his father would later tell curator Franklin Sermons in 1992. Ahead of his peers, he is said to have began reading and writing by age four, and as he delved deeper into his creative side, his mother with a creative streak of her own, particularly in the area of fashion design, strongly encouraged him to pursue his artistic talents. From the age of five, she would take him to visit their city's local art museums, like the Metropolitan Museum, and by age six, enroll him as a junior member of the Brooklyn Museum of Art. His family was quite financially well off, so in 1968, age seven, they were able to send him to St. Anne's School, a prestigious private institution. It was here that he would develop a friendship with Mark Prozo, who he would go on to collaborate with on a children's book, with Basquet doing the writing and Prozo the illustrating. Later that year, while playing ball in the street, age seven, Basquet was struck by a car and sustained a broken arm as well as several internal injuries which required a splenectomy. He spent his nights at the hospital recovering with a copy of Gray's Anatomy by Henry Gray, a gift from his mother. Basquet was instantly captivated by the book, particularly the anatomical drawings. Gray's anatomy had a lasting influence on Basquet, who continued to explore the complexities of the human anatomy throughout his body of work, often mimicking the diagrams in his use of labeling. Basquet's family went through numerous financial issues triggered by the cost of his hospital bills. This likely put an additional strain on the relationship between Gerard and Mathilde, which led to a separation when Basquet was just eight years old. Gerard was granted custody and took on the duty of care for his children, John, Lisanne, and Jeannie, as Mathilde's mental health at the time was on a steady decline as she struggled with depression and other personal mental issues. Although from all accounts, she played a loving and nurturing role in Basquet's life, she was also said to be erratic on random occasions, hitting him for wearing his underwear backwards, threatening to kill her entire family with a jerk of a steering wheel. Basquet once said his mother carried a worry line on her forehead from worrying too much. He called her a bruja, a sorceress. He told one interviewer she went crazy as a result of a bad marriage. By 1970, she was admitted into a psychiatric hospital, and from then on, Mathilde would spend her life in and out of mental institutions. Basquet struggled to cope with his mother's instability and rebelled often against his father. Their relationship during his teenage years were especially strained. Gerard was an upwardly mobile, traditional middle-class immigrant who wanted nothing more than to pass down his values into his oldest son, but John wanted no parts. Sources confirm that Gerard often used beatings as a method of discipline and was incredibly cruel. Gerard reportedly once beat his son so severely that Jean-Michel went to school the next day walking with a cane. Gerard has denied this. Other times, the story goes, he was so badly beaten that he had to make an emergency call to the police. Phoebe Holben writes that John also claimed his father once stabbed him in the buttock after he was caught having sex with a male cousin. Gerard later moved him and his two younger sisters from East Flatbush to a townhouse in Boreham Hill. 
There he played the happy divorcee in tailored suits with brass buttons driving a Mercedes Benz. He always insisted the Basquets had been an elite family in Haiti, obtained a night school degree in accounting, and eventually became the controller for the Macmillan Publishing Company. Jean, on the other hand, disappeared into the crawl space beneath the staircase, covering it in his drawings. In 1974, at the age of 14, the family relocated to Miramar, Puerto Rico, and lived there for two years. It was there he experienced the first of many homosexual encounters. Upon the family's return to Brooklyn in 1976, just two years later, John was then enrolled into Edward R. Murrow High School. But his enrollment would not last as he would often skip school on numerous occasions, leading to his eventual dropout just months later. He also made a habit of running away from home usually due to his rebelliousness and tumultuous relationship with his father. He ran away from home at 15 when his father caught him smoking pot in his room. On the streets, he survived by sleeping on park benches at Washington Square Park and taking LSD. Eventually, his father spotted him with a shaved head and called the police to bring him home. John was not a fan of structured education and didn't like obedience, as Gerard recalled. He eventually landed at the Manhattan City A School in 10th grade. City A School was a refuge for gifted New York children who did not respond well to traditional learning. It used the city's cultural institutions as classrooms and regularly gave its students subway tokens for rides to the Hayden Planetarium and MoMA. He would maintain the habit of skipping school with his friends, but with encouragement from teachers, continued developing his artistic prowess in the company of other atypical artistic students. Soon he was writing and illustrating for the school's newspaper. It was during this time that he developed the alter ego with his friend Aldias, which they named Samo. In a later interview that year, John explained, We were smoking some grass one night and I'd said something about it being the same old sh Imagine this, selling packs of Samo. It started like that, as a private joke, and then it grew. Next, they drew a series of cartoons for the school paper showing people's faces before and after using Samo, with captions like, I used to be a lame before I started Samo. Now I get some poontang every day. Teachers remembered him as uncommonly talented, drawing all the time, on his textbooks, desks, homework, and anywhere with a clear surface, but that he was also very angry. His reckless behavior would come to a head when he dumped a box of shaving cream on the principal's head as a dare at his friend Aldiaz's graduation, who was the year above him. He was expelled and could not return for his last year of high school. From then on, Basquet traveled down the path of self-education by visiting New York museums and frequenting other creative hubs like Soho, where the contemporary art galleries had begun to congregate. From 1978, his graffiti poetry and satirical advertising slogans signed with the moniker Samo began to show up on walls. The same year in which, at the age of 17, going on 18, his father, losing all hope for Jean, ever straightening up in his studies, kicked him out of his house when he refused to continue formal education. By this time, he had dropped out or been kicked out from five to six schools in total. To support himself financially, he got a job at the Unique Clothing Warehouse in North Houston Streets, or NoHo for short. Harvey Russack, founder of Unique Clothing, had discovered Basquet and his graffiti on the building and offered him a job. But his career really took off that same year on the 11th of December when an article was published about his graffiti in the Village Voice. The title read, Samo Graffiti, Bourgeois or CIA. The publication had gone looking for Basquet to unveil the artist behind the moniker. An excerpt reads, we had pretty much stopped looking at the walls until this fall when we noticed something new. The best graffiti suddenly had more to say than just a nickname, a number. But who was writing, one woman is every 10 minutes, castrate or drawing chalk outlines of fallen bodies with bright red bloodstains? And who the hell was this guy, Samo? 
When 19 came around, the article had attracted the attentions of Glenn O'Brien while researching information on the city's graffiti culture. O'Brien invited him to appear on his critical and eccentric public access show, TV Party, an experience the young artist reveled in. The name of the first episode was called The Classic Leather Jacket, and for his first appearance, Jean wore a faded service station work shirt and his hair shaved to a distinctive point. O'Brien showcased his punk sensibilities with a timeless black leather short moto jacket, which he invited the artist to decorate during the show. Basquet painted an outline of a crown across the back of the jacket, which remained one of O'Brien's prized possessions. From then, Jean became a show regular, occasionally taking over the backstage keyboard to type sporadic phrases of analog text that would appear on the screen. On April 29, 1979, in a loft building in the north side of Canal Street, about two blocks west of the river, Michael Holman, a New York-based artist, writer, filmmaker, and musician, threw a Canal Zone party where he would invite downtown and uptown artists around the city together, and Jean was in attendance. It was there he met the other members of the band Test Pattern, which later became Grey. At the start, they were Vincent Gallo, Wayne Clifford, Nick Taylor, Shannon Dawson. Regarding this meeting, Michael was quoted saying, John Michael Basquet had heard about this. He didn't know any of us and none of us knew him, but we had heard of him because we had all seen the same old graffiti tags everywhere that he was doing with Al Diaz. John shows up early at the party, at the beginning before it really got started, told us who he was and then demanded to have participation as an artist in this. So we were like, yeah, sure. But that was the nature of those days. He was so far ahead of everyone. He was like five years younger than me, maybe 19 at the time, but he was 50 years older than me in terms of sophistication and understanding and making it as an artist. He was 50 years in front of everybody. I went up to him off camera and he said, you want to start a band? And I was like, sure. They would go on to describe the music they created as angry, blaring, loud and confrontational, but sometimes mellow. Shannon played the trumpet, Wayne played the keyboard, Michael played some drums and Jean played either the clarinet or a wasp synthesizer. They performed at nightclubs such as Max Kansas City, CBGB, Hurrah or The Mud Club. The group went on to become one of the first bands to perform at A's, an interdisciplinary loft space that became a hub for music, exhibitions, performance arts, films and videos in 1979. A's was co-founded by Arlene Schloss, a performance and video slash film artist. It was also at A's in October of the same year that Basquet used xerography to create posters of A's under his Samo tag. Since its introduction in the 70s, downtown artists began using this form of inexpensive print production of xerography as a way to create posters for advertisements. Schloss also gave him space to develop a line of hand-painted clothing under the label Man Made. The artist's man-made garments were upcycled from materials he sourced from the streets and repurposed. In November 1979, costume designer Patricia Field sold pieces from Man Made in her upscale boutique on 8th Street in the East Village and also displayed his sculptures in the store window. Another relationship he developed from the Canal Zone party was with a 20-year-old Jennifer Stein. I lived where the party was, says Stein, and Basquet came and graffitied on the wall, and I said, oh my god, I've been looking for you, because everybody knew Samo graffiti, but we didn't know who it was. I said, I live here, let me show you my room. So he came in and I had a whole wall of baseball cards that I'd painted the face out of, and he took my correction fluid and wrote names under them. We were laughing so hard, and he said, we have to make postcards. So we did that, and we mounted them on the raggedy-ass piece of cardboard and were walking around New York City, interacting with people and saying, postcards, postcards, one dollar, one dollar. We'd stand there screaming. We went everywhere trying to sell them. 
The side venture led to Jean's first meeting with Andy Warhol. Jennifer goes on to explain, he sold stupid games bad ideas to Warhol. We were walking past this restaurant and Andy Warhol is sitting in there with Henry Geldzaller, who was the head of the Metropolitan Museum. For accommodation around that time, Jean was living with his friend Alexis Adler in a six-floor walk-up in East Village, Manhattan, who was a Bernard biology graduate with a strong hippie streak. Some sources confirmed they were also dating at the time. He was four years her junior, and she and her friends in the club scene had been admiring his street graffiti and same tag all over downtown. During the months they lived together, while Alexis worked in the lab at Rockefeller University, Jean transformed the floors, walls, doors, and furniture into raw materials for his creative explorations. In his sketches, now on display at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, he copied and mapped out diagrams of chemical compounds he borrowed from her science textbooks. He also painted clothing belonging to Alexis, often without her permission. The day after buying a gold lame coat, she was irritated to discover he had painted all over it in the night. In early 1980, an almost 20-year-old Basquet had a fallen out with Diaz and soon began to focus on his own painting career, which was gaining some momentum. Basquet said, I wrote, Say Mo is dead all over the place, and I started painting. His friend Keith Haring held a mock wake for Say Mo at Club 57. In June 1980, he appeared in High Times magazine, his first national publication, as part of an article titled Graffiti 80, The State of the Outlaw Art, by Glenn O'Brien. A little later that year, he began filming O'Brien's independent film, Downtown 81, originally titled New York Beats, which featured some of Gray's recordings on its soundtrack. Collaboration projects incorporated or otherwise collab and Fashion Moda sponsored the multi-artist event, the Times Square Show, in which Basquet took part. Jeffrey D. Chu wrote about him in an article titled Reports from Times Square in the September 1980 issue of Art in America, was one critic and curator who took note of him and described his works as a knockout combination of de Kooning and subway spray paint scribbles. Pasquet took part in the Diego Cortez curated New York New Wave exhibition in February 1981 at New York's PS1, which featured work from 119 artists, including Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, Robert Maplethorpe, and Nan Golden. Italian dealer Emilio Mazzoli was introduced to Pasquet's work by Italian artist Sandro Chia who instantly purchased 10 of the artist's works so that Basquet could have a display at his gallery in Modena, Italy, in May 1981. After they had filmed Downtown 81 together, rock band Blondie lead singer Debbie Harry had purchased Basquet's first painting, The Cardillac Moon, completed that same year for $200, but sources say Emilio Mazzoli paid $10,000 in total for the 10 pieces. The value of his artistic output gained unprecedented growth in such a short time frame. The first in-depth essay about Basquet was The Radiant Child, written by art critic René Richard, and published in Art Forum magazine in December 1981. During this time, Basquet painted numerous works on items he discovered in streets, such as abandoned doors. He had also featured as a disc jockey in the 1981 Blondie music video Rapture, a role originally intended for Grandmaster Flash. At the time, Basquet was living with his girlfriend Suzanne Malouk, who had moved from Canada to become an artist and financially supported him as a waitress. They had met when she was bartending at Nightbird. Basquet would come in, stand at the back of the room, and stare at her. Initially, she thought he was a hobo. He had shaved his hair at the front of his head, bleached baby dreads at the back, and wore a coat five sizes too big. He wouldn't come to the bar because he had no money for drinks, she recalls. But then after two weeks, he came in, put a load of change down, and bought the most expensive drink in the place. Remy Martin, $7. Malouk was intrigued. They were the same age and had a lot in common. 
Within eight months, there was money everywhere, she continued. I watched him sell his first painting to Deborah Harry for $200, and then a few months later, he was selling paintings for $20,000 each, selling them faster than he could paint them. I watched him make his first million. We went from stealing bread on the way home from the mud club and eating pasta to buying groceries at Dean and DeLuca. The fridge was full of pastries and caviar. We were drinking crystal champagne. We were 21 years old. Basquet would leave piles of cash around the apartment and buy Armani suits by the dozen, throw parties with hills of cocaine. His rise coincided with a change in the city. Financiers were looking to invest in arts, and they were hunting around art shows, snatching up new work. Following Diego Cortez's New York New Wave exhibition, Italian-born art dealer and gallerist Anina Rosé said she asked the curator Diego if she could come by and view the works privately, since she wanted to include more New York-based artists into her roster. He agreed. Soon after the show, Basquet invited her over to his then-girlfriend Suzanne Malouk's apartment, where he showed Nose his work. She says, There were mostly drawings, numerous drawings, beautiful. After they went for coffee, he wanted to join her gallery, but Nose ever practically told him, I really like the work, but there were no paintings, she says. Instead, she included him in a group show with Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer. Since she still needed works on canvas to display, she let him use the basement of the gallery as his studio. In her space on Wooster Street, Nose lets visiting international artists like Giulio Galan and Mazimo Kaufman use studio space when they were in New York. It was always occupied by an artist, she says. In 1982, Nose arranged for him to move into a loft which also served as a studio at 101 Crosby Street in Soho. He had his first American one-man show at Anina Nose Gallery in March 1982. In the summer of 1982, Basquet traveled to Modena, northern Italy, for one of his first solo exhibitions in Europe at the Gallery of Emilio Mazzoli. Emilio had demanded these paintings be completed within a week. Within just a few days, holed up in a warehouse in the city's industrial hinterlands, Basquet made use of pre-stretched and primed large-format canvases that had been created for the Italian painter Mario Schifano. Their wall-like format, approximately two and a half by four meters in size, perfectly suited Basquet, an artist who had experimented on the expansive sidewalks and facades of Manhattan's Lower East Side. He completed a group of eight large format paintings that surpassed his previous works in scale. They were executed in acrylic, spray paint, and oil stick. I think Basquet enjoyed going to Medena, says Sam Keller. Mazzoli is a really nice guy. He showed us Polaroids and photographs of them eating and drinking, partying together. Basquet wanted to eat well and go see museums. I think the frustration was that the exhibition didn't happen. Keller explains that there were disagreements between Mazzoli and Anina Nose, the artist's New York dealer, about the proceeds and who would get credits for the project. Basquet was caught between them. The clash sabotaged the show. Basquet had mixed feelings about his Italian sojourn. At the end of the week, Mazzoli paid him for the works which went on to disappear into various separate collections, and the painter returned to New York. In an interview given years later to the New York Times, he called the warehouse a sick factory. The Modena paintings are focused. There are fewer words, scribbles, and signs present than in many of Basquet's later works. They were much more painterly, says Keller. It's almost always different things mixed in a unique way. For instance, in one of the Modena works titled The Guilt of Gold Teeth, there is a figure of a man in a top hat, possibly a reference to the voodoo culture of Basquet's Haitian heritage, or alternatively, the style of hat worn by Mazzoli. By the summer of 1982, Basquet had left the Anina Nose Gallery and gallerist Bruno Biscoff Berger became his worldwide art dealer, and in June 1982, at 21, Basquet became the youngest artist to ever take part in Documenta in Kassel, Germany. His works were exhibited alongside Joseph Buse, Anselm Kiefer, 
Gerhard Richter, C. Twombly, and Andy Warhol. Bruno Biscoff Berger, a Swiss art dealer and collector, popularly known till date as the man who married John Michel Basquet to Andy Warhol, gave Basquet a one-man show at his Zurich Gallery in September 1982 and arranged for him to meet Warhol for lunch on October 4, 1982. Warhol took a Polaroid shot. Basquet seized the photograph, ran back to his studio, and two hours later had the double portrait painting Dos Habezas, Two Heads, still wet, delivered to the table. Oh, I'm so jealous, Warhol exclaimed. He's faster than me. This painting ignited a friendship between them. They would visit a salon, have phone conversations, and travel together. And the elder statesman of pop art even visited his young friend's family in Borum Hill, Brooklyn, for a meal. Basquet's mother, Mathilde, posted Warhol a complimentary card after he painted her portrait later. But plenty speculated about the motives behind this odd, unexpected friendship, and many thought the two were using each other for personal gain. Warhol's longtime studio assistant, Ronnie Coltrone, remembers, It was like some crazy art world marriage, and they were the odd couple. The relationship was symbiotic. Jean-Michel thought he needed Andy's fame, and Andy thought he needed Jean-Michel's new blood. Others, however, were more convinced of a genuine adoration between the two. Late interview editor Glenn O'Brien insisted, Andy loved Jean-Michel like a son almost. Regarding their relationship, Suzanne Maluk went on to say, It wasn't that he only saw Andy as a father figure. He also really had a flirtation with him. Often when I was with the two of them together, it didn't feel like I was there with John. It felt like I was there with two lovers. John had the history of being bisexual, but Warhol was asexual, so I don't know. In November 1982, Basquet's solo exhibition opened at the Fun Gallery in East Village. Among the works exhibited were A Panel of Experts and Equals Pie, and in the fall of 1982, Jean-Michel Basquet was living at art dealer Larry Gagosian's Venice Beach home, making swarms of new paintings in his private wing of the house. Gagosian had been electrified by the 21-year-old artist's work, so he and Nose collaborated on Basquet's first West Coast exhibition at Larry Gagosian Gallery in the spring of 1982, after which Gagosian invited the artist to move into his Market Street house so he could create new paintings for a second LA show in 1983. When he wasn't working, Basquet loved to shop for clothes at the high-end Maxfield Blue in what's now West Hollywood. But the New York artist didn't drive and Gagosian had temporarily lost his license, he says. So Basquet's girlfriend at the time, a not yet famous singer named Madonna, then visiting from New York, drove the three of them around town. Gagosian recalled, everything was going along fine. Jean-Michel was making paintings, I was selling them, and we were having a lot of fun. But then one day Jean-Michel said, my girlfriend is coming to stay with me. So I said, well, what's she like? And he said, her name is Madonna and she's going to be huge. I'll never forget that he said that. In 1983, Basquet was photographed by James Van Der Zee for an interview with Henry Gelzeller published in the January 1983 issue of Warhol's Interview magazine. Basquet took considerable interest in the work that artist Robert Rauschenberg was producing at Gemini, G-E-L, in West Hollywood. He visited him on several occasions and found inspiration in his accomplishments. While in Los Angeles, Basquet painted Hollywood Africans, which addressed the multiple stereotypes involving people of color in the entertainment industry, as well as American society at large. Around the canvas, he paints obscured phrases such as sugarcane, tobacco, gangsterism, and what is buona, to describe the limited roles that African-American actors faced in Hollywood due to discrimination. He also included in the trio of images the artist himself, the rap musician Ramel Z, and the painter Toxic, who had traveled with him from New York to Los Angeles. 
He often painted portraits of other graffiti artists and sometimes collaborators in works such as Portraits of A1, aka King Toxic and Eero. In 1983, he produced the hip hop record Beat Bop, featuring Ramosey and rapper K Rob. It was pressed in limited quantities on his Tartown Inc. imprint. He created the iconic artwork for the record cover, which is more sought after than the actual vinyl record. Basquet wanted to rhyme too, Ramosi revealed in an interview regarding the recording process. But when he went to pick up the mic, we all started laughing and he went back over there and sat down and started rocking back and forth in his chair again. In March 1983, at 22 years old, Basquet became one of the youngest artists to participate in the Whitney Biennale Exhibition of Contemporary Art, displaying works alongside Cindy Sherman, Keith Haring, and Barbara Kruger. The 22-year-old showcased Untitled and The Dutch Settlers. It was around this time that Basquet began dating Paige Powell, an editor at Interview Magazine who worked closely with Warhol. Paige later organized a show for his work at her friend's New York apartment in April 1983. Although the Andy Warhol Diaries cites August 9, 1983 as the couple's first date, for Powell, the enduring impression came earlier. It was 1981, around the time she saw a show of graffiti artist A1 over at Fashion Moda in the South Bronx. Her boyfriend at the time, Jay Shriver, Warhol's technical assistant, took her to Basquet's loft in Crosby Street. We really got on together, so he was always trying to go out with me and trying to take me to Jamaica and different places, said Powell in a later interview. So he would do stuff, but I wasn't romantically involved with him then because I had a boyfriend. And also he was doing drugs, and then he got himself cleaned up. Later that same August, Basquet moved into a loft owned by Warhol at 57 Great Jones Street in NoHo, which also served as a studio. In the summer of 1983, Basquet invited Lee Jaff, a former musician in Bob Marley's band, to join him on a trip throughout Asia and Europe. Jaff, a cross-disciplinary visual artist, musician and poet, took several photos of John during the trip. For me, watching him paint reminded me of the times I would sit and play harmonica while Bob Marley and his acoustic guitar would be writing songs that were eventually to become classics. With John and Bob, it seemed like they were channeling inspiration coming from an otherworldly place. I could be at his studio and he could be carrying on a conversation and there'd be music and he wouldn't stop painting, which was really exciting. I mean, there's all this stuff going on and then you're watching it this masterpiece. On his return to New York, he was deeply affected by the death of Michael Stewart, an aspiring black artist in the downtown club scene, who was beaten to death by transit police in September 1983. He was distraught, friends recall, and said repeatedly, it could have been me. In the early hours of September 15, 1983, aspiring artist and model Michael Stewart left the Pyramid Club in Manhattan's Lower East Side and headed for the First Avenue and 14th Street subway station to catch a train back home to Brooklyn. As he waited for the train, the 25-year-old allegedly pulled out a marker and began scrawling graffiti on the wall, probably not noticing that transit police were watching him intently. The event that followed are not entirely clear, but at 3.20 a.m., he arrived at Bellevue Hospital in police custody, hogtied and badly bruised with no pulse. Seeing his own life reflected in the death of a fellow artist, Basquet went on to create the facement, the death of Michael Stewart, in response to the incident. He also participated in the Christmas benefit with various New York artists for the family of Michael Stewart in 1983. Having joined the Mary Boone Soho Gallery in 1983, Basquet had his first show there in May 1984. A large number of photographs depict a collaboration between Warhol and Basquet in 1984 and 1985. Painting with Jean Michel was not easy, recalled artist Keith Haring, a downtown contemporary of Basquet's. You had to forget any preconceived ideas of ownership and he prepared to have anything you'd done completely painted over within seconds. Warhol found the challenge stimulating. 
Andy loved the energy with which John would totally eradicate one image and enhance another, Hardin said. Though sometimes exasperated by Basquet's erratic habits, Warhol was genuinely impressed by his art. Jean-Michel came over to the office to paint, but he fell asleep on the floor, Warhol recorded in late 1984. He looked like a bum lying there, but I woke him up and he did two masterpieces that were great. He got me painting differently. Basquet got Warhol interested in painting by hand after more than 20 years of using the more mechanical silkscreen printing process. Andy would start one and put something very recognizable on it, or a product logo, and I would sort of deface it, Basquet recalled, and I would try to get him to work some more on it. I would try to get him to do at least two things. In some works, like Sweet Pungent, Basquet would make the first contribution, at times using Warhol's silkscreen technique to reproduce his own line-drawn sketches. They made an homage to the 1984 Summer Olympics with Olympics. Other collaborations include Taxi, 45th Broadway, and Zenith. Their joint exhibition paintings at the Tony Shafrazi Gallery caused a rift in their friendship after it was panned by critics and art critic Vivian Renner wrote about the exhibition in the New York Times declaring, the collaboration looks like one of Warhol's manipulations. Basquet, meanwhile, comes across as the all-too-willing accessory and claimed Warhol was using Basquet as a mascot. Tamara Davis says that this was very hard for Basquet. Jean-Michel embraced Andy at a time when Andy was not very popular, she recalled. I don't know if Jean-Michel felt bad that he let Andy down or if he believed what the press said and that Andy was taking advantage of him. This failed exhibition meant that the two artists barely spoke afterwards and affected the final years of their friendship. While a bit of bad press and disinterest was nothing new for Warhol, Basquet was undoubtedly counting on their show to reinforce his selfhood as an artist and mobilize his position in the high art scene. In Andy's diary, he apologizes to Jean-Michel about the mascot remark and supposedly he was not mad about it but the failed exhibition certainly dismantled Basquet's ego, and he no longer visited Andy for their regular painting sessions at the factory. A few months later, Andy writes in his diary, Jean-Michel hasn't called me in a month, so I guess it's really over. Basquet left New York hurt and depressed. He wanted to keep a distance between the two artists' works, to be seen as one significant person and not a duo. Although their collaborations had initially failed, their work now attracts global attention and acclaim. Their 1984 painting Olympics sold for more than $10 million in 2012. Basquet consistently made a habit of painting in expensive Armani suits and will appear in public in the same paint-splattered clothes. Nile Rogers, the musician who ran into Basquet in a Maxfield Blue store and gave him a ride, later found he had left half a dozen brand new Armani suits in the car. He was a regular at the area nightclub, where he sometimes worked the turntables as a DJ for fun. He also painted murals for the Palladium nightclub in New York City, all the while his rise to fame continued to be documented in the media. He appeared on the cover of February 10, 1985 issue of the New York Times Magazine in a feature titled New Art, New Money, The Marketing of an American Artist. An excerpt from the article reads, The extent of Basquet's success would no doubt be impossible for an artist of lesser gifts. Not only does he possess a bold sense of color and composition, but in his best paintings, unlike many of his contemporaries, he maintains a fine balance between seemingly contradictory forces, control and spontaneity, menace and wit, urban imagery and primitivism. Still, the nature and rapidity of his climb is unimaginable in another era. His work appeared in GQ and Esquire, and he was interviewed for MTV's Art Break segment. He opened six shows in a single year, which is impressive for any artist. In 1984, he walked the runway for the Comme des Garçons Spring Fashion Show in New York. Basquet was always an art market star. In the mid-1980s, the artist was making $1.4 million a year and receiving lump sums of $40,000 from art dealers, 
even as his dependence on narcotics continued to spiral out of control. Basquet's cocaine use became so excessive that he blew a hole in his nasal septum. The more money Basquet made, the more paranoid and deeply involved with drugs he became. He wouldn't stop doing heroin, recounted Madonna. A lot of his art world peers theorized that his drug use was as a means of coping with the demands of his sudden fame, the exploitative nature of the art industry, and the pressures of being a black artist in a white-dominated art world. But his work ethic continued to be consistent in the face of all this. For what would be his last exhibition on the West Coast, Basquet returned to Los Angeles for his show at the Gagosian Gallery in January 1986. In February 1986, Basquet traveled to Atlanta, Georgia for an exhibition of his drawings at Faye Gold Gallery. That month, he participated in Limelight's Art Against Apartheid Benefits. In the summer, he had a solo exhibition at Gallery Thaddeus Ropak in Salzburg. He was also invited to walk the runway for Ray Kawakubo again, this time at the Comme des Garçons Home Plus Fashion Show in Paris. In October 1986, Basquet flew to Ivory Coast for an exhibition of his work organized by Bruno Bischoff Berger at the French Cultural Institute in Abidjan. He was accompanied by his girlfriend Jennifer Good, who worked at his frequent hangout area nightclub. In November 1986, at 25 years old, Basquet became the youngest artist given an exhibition at Kessner Gesellschaft in Hanover, Germany. During their relationship, Good became pregnant by Basquet, but she had an abortion. She also started snorting heroin with him since drugs were at her disposal. She said, he didn't push it on me, but it was just there and I was so naive. In late 1986, she successfully got herself and Basquet into a methadone program in Manhattan, but he quit after three weeks. Good broke up with him afterwards in November 1986, though they continued seeing each other. She told Interview Magazine in 2017, I wasn't over him at all. It was just that at a certain point, I started to realize I couldn't continue in that way. I had to stop doing drugs, and the only way to stop doing drugs was to break up with him. According to Good, he did not start injecting heroin until after she ended their relationship. This dissent may have been triggered by a later tragedy. When Andy Warhol died unexpectedly in February 1987 during a gallbladder operation, it left a hole in New York City's art scene. Pasquet was deeply affected and immediately became somewhat of a social recluse as he struggled to keep up with his artistic lifestyle, ramping up his destructive behavior and relying on his heroin addiction to occupy himself. It took a toll on both his health and state of mind, consequently revealing the extent to which Warhol had been his rock. They had a falling out and they never had a chance to repair that, Maluk explains. He really went downhill after that. The last year and a half of Jean-Michel Basquet's life was marked by prolific artistic production but personal turmoil, and he himself would be dead within that time. In 1987, Basquet had exhibitions at Gallery Daniel Templon in Paris, the Akira Ikeda Gallery in Tokyo, and the Tony Shafrazi Gallery in New York. He designed a Ferris wheel for Andre Heller's Luna Luna, an ephemeral amusement park in Hamburg from June to August 1987, with rides designed by renowned contemporary artists. In January 1988, he traveled to Paris for his exhibition at the Yvonne Lambert Gallery and to Dusseldorf for an exhibition at the Hans Mayer Gallery. While in Paris, he befriended Ivorian artist Utara Watts. They made plans to travel together to Watts' birthplace, Corhogo, that summer. Rick Prohl helped the artist prepare for what became his final show at the Vrij Bajuman Gallery that spring. He seemed like a ghost. Like something was gone, remembers Prol, who had been hired by Baghumian in hopes that he might inspire the barely functioning artist. He didn't seem interested in anything, sex or seeing anybody or doing the work. He seemed very isolated and alone. Following the exhibition at the Vrij Baghumian Gallery in New York in April 1988, Basquet traveled to Maui in June to withdraw from drug use, claiming that there was no heroin there. 
After returning to New York in July, he ran into Keith Haring on Broadway, who stated that this last encounter was the only time Basquet ever discussed his drug problem with him. Glenn O'Brien also recalled Basquet calling him and telling him he was feeling really good. Among Basquet's final paintings, Riding with Death, which was painted in 1988, stands out. This haunting composition expresses a pessimistic view of the world state, suggesting a journey towards death that he would embark on shortly after. Despite attempts at sobriety, Basquet died at the age of 27 of a heroin overdose at his home in Great Jones Street in Manhattan on August 12, 1988. He never even got to turn 28. He had been found unresponsive in his bedroom by his girlfriend Kelly Inman and was taken to Cabrini Medical Center where he was pronounced dead on arrival. Inman and Basquet met when she was working as a waitress at Nell's Two days later, she was living with him. The 22-year-old was downstairs writing in the journal that Basquet had given her. He usually slept all day, she recalled, but when he still hadn't come down for breakfast by mid-afternoon, I got worried. When she looked into the bedroom to check up on him, the heat hit her full in the face like a wave, but Basquet seemed to be sleeping peacefully, so she went back downstairs. She and the housekeeper heard what sounded like loud snores, but thought nothing of it. A few hours later, Basquet's friend Kevin Bray called. He and Basquet and another friend, Victor Littlejohn, were supposed to go on a Run DMC concert that evening, and he wanted to go over their plans. The day before, Basquet had spent the early hours doing drugs and after an eventful night out, had gone back to the Great Jones Loft with Kevin Bray, but Basquet kept nodding off. Bray wrote him a note saying, I don't want to sit here and watch you die. Read it out to him and left. Kelly climbed back up the stairs to pass on to Basquet, Bray's phone call. This time she found him stretched on the floor, his head resting on his arm like a child, a small pool of vomit forming near his chin. At his private funeral held at Frank E. Campbell Funeral Chapel on August 17, 1988, Blanca Martinez, Basquet's housekeeper, was struck by the alienated attitude of the mourners. They were all standing separately as if it were an obligation, she says. They didn't seem to care. Some looked ashamed. People began to leave the cemetery before the body was even buried, ignoring the objections of the gravediggers. Among the attendees were immediate family and close friends, including Keith Haring, Francesco Clement, Glenn O'Brien, and Basquet's former girlfriend, Paige Powell. Art dealer Jeffrey Deitch delivered a eulogy. The artist's drug habit had been a big source of friction between father and son, who were rumored to not be speaking at the end of Jean-Michel's life. Gerard had claimed that he didn't know how bad his son's drug habit was, Never mind that, as Glenn O'Brien recalls, Jean-Michel got these splotches on his face, so people were going around saying he had AIDS. O'Brien added that Basquet was self-conscious about his bad skin, meeting with doctors about it, and once showing up at the nightclub Nails, wearing an aluminium mask that he kept on all night while dancing like a madman. Gerard allegedly tried to keep his son's friends away from his funeral, blaming them for his overdose. A public memorial was later held at St. Peter's Church on November 3, 1988. Among the speakers was Ingrid Sishi, who, as the editor of Art Forum, got to know Basquet well and commissioned a number of articles that introduced his work to the wider world. The 300 guests included musicians John Lurie and Arto Lindsay, Keith Haring, poet David Shapiro, Glenn O'Brien, and members of Basquet's former band Grey. His friend Fab Five Freddy read the poem by Langston Hughes, and Basquet's former girlfriend Susan Malloch recited sections of A.R. Peng's poem for Basquet with an opening line of, I say to you hello and ends, without a cry, I say to you, goodbye.